She's muted. Good morning, Christy. Can you hear us? We are. Did I did I join? Let's see. Hi. Hi. Did we join in the right uh, way? Yes. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Good we have uh, we have 148 participants uh, who have joined us for this webinar. Good morning to all of you at the Department of Human Services. Uh, Chad Allgood, Christy McHale, and Andrea Sanders. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, uh, we are uh, joined by, as I said, uh, we're now at 150 child care providers who've joined us from all across the state, and we're inviting them to submit their questions on the Q&A function on the webinar, and what we would like is for you all to open up by giving us an update, uh, information about where we are right now, uh, and then after you're finished, I will ask the questions that have come in for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Andrea Sanders, and I am general counsel for the Department of Human Services. I have Christy McHale, as Carol said, who is the division director for early child care and development, and uh, Chad Allgood, who has joined us from the health department as Christy's deputy. Um, first, I would like to say thank you all for taking time this morning to join us. Um, I want to thank all of you for your interest and your concern. Um, you know, the word unprecedented has been used an unprecedented amount of times in the last three weeks. Uh, but needless to say, we are all every single day assessing the situation and finding ourselves in uh, a new uh, set of problems that we just have to work through. So um, I want you to know, first of all, that Christy and Chad have been, <laughs> excuse me, Christy and Chad have been diligently working this problem since the first week of March. I left to go out of town at the end of probably around March 9th. And we met then and we talked about this problem that we saw on the horizon, this virus that was coming. They have been working through the weekend, around the clock, putting together uh, emergency plans. Can y'all hear me? Can you still hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. And also considering, um, well, basically two, two, a two-pronged problem that we feel like we have to tackle and balance here at DHS uh, through the child care program. Uh, one prong is how, how can we help support and stabilize our existing child care workforce in Mississippi? for the long term. And the other prong of the problem is, what can we do to respond and support uh, those essential critical workers that we know in the next few weeks in Mississippi are going to be the difference between life and death for a lot of people. So how can childcare step up to the plate and support essential workers and critical workers really like healthcare, uh, support and food supply chain um, or, or medical supply chain. So um, that being said, uh, I will turn it over to Christy and Chad and um, Carol, I believe that you said that you were also taking questions. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And I'll, I'll ask those questions as we're receiving them once the three of you have finished your opening remarks. Okay. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Christy McHale here. Um, I just wanted to give you an update on some of the work that we've been doing that's already been completed at NDHS. Um, 
We have successfully moved all of our staff remotely, except for those of us on video right now. So you should not have seen any interruption in service with the call center or with applications. We're continuing to do our day-to-day -day business. Um, so that should be still going well. Also, we had some questions early on about what would happen for the parents that are going through redetermination right now. Um, due to kind of this unique situation, sometimes they're not able to get all the verification documents, for instance, that are going on, or maybe there's been some work issues. Right now, if they are going through redetermination, even if that deadline expires and they don't have everything in, they are basically on an emergency status that allows them to continue to keep their certificates. So we are not cutting anyone that is in redetermination off. Their certificates are continuing. So there's no need to be concerned about that. Um, everyone on the child care payment program received an email about being paid based on enrollment instead of attendance. We wanted to make sure that we were able to support our providers and continue to let them get paid because we knew we were going to have some parents that were going to make choices to bring their children home and not be in the centers. So if that child was in that center or enrolled as of March 1, they're considered enrolled for the month and we continue to pay that based on enrollment. We're doing the same for April. The other um, measure that we've put in place is we now will not allow children to, that are enrolled to move to a center that's closed. We don't have, the, there's not going to be any transfers between centers. If, if you're a center and that child's enrolled, we're trying to move to a closed center, that doesn't make sense to us to do that. Um, of course, if the center's open, that's parent choice, and we would allow that child to transfer with their two week notice. Um, I want to make sure that y'all are looking at the website. So um, you can go to MDHS and there's the link to the COVID-19 page. You could also do it through CCAC. There's a very prominent COVID-19 page. We have done, a, I think, a pretty good job of starting to update that. It'll, there'll be a lot more updates coming over the next few days as we prepare to give information like protocols. I'm actually going to pass it to Chad now to talk about the ones that we put up yesterday, which are some just based on the collaboration of information we've gotten some good recommendations for providers. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so we've been in contact with the Department of Health, and as I understand it, they're going to be doing a webinar tomorrow and give some additional information, um, you know, on the health and safety pieces. But, um, you know, the, um, the governor did issue an executive order um, which is, you can see all the executive orders on our update, our COVID-19 page, where we classify Chad, child care. Chad, Chad, could I interrupt you just a second? We're getting a number of sure. comments from people that they can't hear. I want to make sure okay. that they're, that they're um, uh, if you would make sure that you've checked your audio and check to make sure that you haven't hit the mute button. By Let's the switch screen. to... Carol, you want us to switch to phone audio so we can pull it closer? No, and you're we'll... good. Your, your, your audio is coming through if the Wi-Fi is working for those who are participating. Um, uh, can, yeah, I think that if you could just double check. Okay, good. Um, we, we're hearing the audio is clear now, so go ahead. I'm sorry for the interruption. Okay. Do I need to repeat what I some of what I said, or is it with Chad? Backtrack a little bit. I think just to backtrack a little bit would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just a quick overview of what I was saying. Um, call centers are still open. The applications are still being worked on. That's business as usual. They're working remotely. Uh, the parents that are in redeterminations right now, those certificates are not being terminated. If for some reason they're not able to make their deadline based on sort of COVID issues, not being able to get verification documents, issues like that. So no certificates are being cut off. They're in redetermination right now. Um, we are not transferring children to closed centers. Okay, so if someone tries to move to a closed center, unless it's open, that transfer will not happen. Um, we also have, you know, we're paying based on enrollment, which all the child care all of a sudden, all the providers that are part of the child care payment program 
we received an email about that, but it's based on enrollments and attendance. Um, oh, the other thing that I did not mention earlier, I'll go ahead and mention now, is we are tracking child care closures. We're actually working with MEMA on that as well. They're very interested to see what areas of the state have centers open and closed. Um, and I think Jack could talk more about that if we have any questions on it. And then I was about to hand it off to Chad. We have the website. You can go to MDHS's website and our child care division, or you could go to CCAC's website, and there's a COVID-19 page. It will take you to the same page that we've set up that has our most recent information and recommendations for child care providers so y'all can stay up to date on the program's information. And Chad's going to go over some protocols and information we posted yesterday. Um, so, again, the just to kind of backtrack with what I was saying, we have been in contact with the Department of Health. Um, as well as the governor's office. Um, the governor did issue an executive order. It's executive order 1463. And there's actually a link to all executive orders on the up the COVID page that's available on our website and the CCAT website. Um, as of right now, uh, child care is classified as an essential support system. Um, and at this point, neither the Department of Health nor the governor's office are mandating closure of child care centers. Um, that being said, we do have some protocol listed on the website. If you choose to stay open, at that point, that is your choice. Um, if you choose to stay open, there are some protocols that we have on the, the COVID-19 um, page um, that can help protect you and help protect your staff. One of the things that we're looking at is group size. And again, these are all things that have been blessed by the Department of Health. With group sizes, they're saying no group size above 10. Um, and, what that, and what that means is, regardless of what your capacity is in your classrooms, whatever, you need to keep your group sizes to no more than 10. That includes your staff members and your children. So if you have toddlers or older, you know your ratio is one to nine. Well, that's your teacher and your nine kids, so you don't need to go above that. The group size includes both your teachers and your children. Infants, you know, you would have to, if you had, you were running eight infants, you would still need your two teachers in the classroom as well. So that's across the board. With those group sizes, it's important that those groups not um, co-mingle in common areas. So in cases where you would normally have all those children out on the playground or you would have more than one classroom like out on the playground at the same time, you need to not do that. Keep your group sizes, keep your groups consistent. So the same group of 10 would go out on the playground, they would come inside, then your second group would go out. Um, you may have to stagger that a little bit differently. The same goes for um, other times like bathroom time. Don't let children from two different groups go to the restroom at the same time. You need to keep all the children in the same group together to try to, um, you know, you don't want those groups to co-mingle. That also applies to like meal time and um, uh, nap time. So, and in the, and it's also very important in the mornings and the uh, evenings when the children are coming in, try not to put them in a common area. Try to get them to their classroom or wherever their group would normally stay um, during the day. So that's one thing. Um, Another thing is hand washing. I know we've been preached at about hand washing to death, um, but it is important that we follow those hand washing guidelines. There is um, the steps for hand washing on the COVID page as well. Um, and I won't go into detail with those. Um, again, one of the other things is it's very crucial that you make sure children are washing their hands as well. That's something that we often miss and make sure they're washing their hands for the 20 seconds and getting a good lather and all those things. Um, something else is cleaning and sanitation. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a page of all the cleaning solutions that the CDC um, recommends that will kill COVID-19, the COVID-19 virus. That includes your Lysol, any Lysol products, any Clorox products. You can also use the bleach solution um, that has forever been a recommendation um, which is about five tablespoons, that's about one third of a cup of bleach per gallon of water. Or that can be four teaspoons um, of bleach per quart of water. 
that's also on the website as well. And just a reminder, if you're going to be using that bleach solution, you need to make sure that you um, create fresh every 24 hours. Don't use a bleach solution that's over 24 hours old because essentially at that point you're basically cleaning with salt water. Um, there are also some recommendations, and I won't go through all these because it is pretty lengthy. If there's a confirmed case of COVID-19 on your site, um, there's a list of some guidelines. And again, these are guidelines. These are not things that we're requiring, but these are um, guidelines that the CDC recommends if you do have a confirmed case of COVID-19. A final thing that you can do is health screenings. Um, and um, this, these um, protocols are a little bit different. One of the things is keeping parents from coming into your site. And I know that is different than what is in the child care regulations. But Department of Health agrees that this is something that can be done and you won't receive any violations for this. The, re the regulations normally require the parents have access to the entire facility. In this case, uh, that, that is going to be waived. So one of the things is actually doing a health screening. Um, you can either have the parents pull up to the front of the building. You can have a room inside your building that's separate from anywhere the children are going to be as a screening area, just to do a quick screening. This would include taking their temperature and their guidelines for that on, on the COVID page. Then just doing a visual screening, um, looking for discharge, signs of illness. Um, the child passes the screen, they go wash their hands first, and then they go to the classroom or they can wash their hands in their classroom. But washing hands is gonna be um, something that's important. Um, and then at pickup time, you actually take the children out to the parents. Um, and that way you're keeping the parents, especially if you're serving parents that are in the medical community that are working in hospitals, things like that. Um, you know, there's even been some guidance about making like that the virus may attach itself to shoes, things like that. So um, keeping your parents, out of the classrooms. Um, again, the, the key here is trying to control who is in and out of those rooms and who may be, um, you know, who may be contributing to the spread of the contagion and limiting that. All right, thank you so much. Sorry, did I interrupt you? No, no. not at all. Um, we're happy to entertain questions if you have Okay, them. great. I have had a number of questions with regard to how to fill out the ledgers, um, whether centers are still required to turn in the attendance, foods the same, do they fill out the ledgers differently? Um, so the, there are a number of questions along those lines. Right. So we are still going to go ahead and do attendance right now because we, we are looking at that data to see you know, how many kids are showing up. Um, there should have been, and maybe I'm wrong, and I, will, and I, I honestly just need to check on this. And we, if we need to send an email out today, we can. Um, there should have been some instructions, like a pop-up on that ledger was my understanding about that. Um, but let me do this. I, I don't, Angela Crockett would be the one that could answer that. Unfortunately, she's not here with us. Um, so let me look at that. And if I need to send some guidance out this afternoon for clarifications, we'll absolutely do that. Um, yeah, let me do this also. I'll go ahead and see if I can get her on the phone to get an answer right away since I've got everybody here. Um, we had one question about whether there'll be any emergency money for summer child care. Uh, we know that um, the, the bill Congress passed uh, included extra money for child care. Our estimate is that that will be somewhere around 46 million additional money for child care. Um, you know, I think that our goals right now, like I said, are to um, work to stabilize the existing support staff, I mean, the existing child care workforce while we are um, asking people to stay home and reduce social contact. And we are also using that money to try to uh, support the health care and other critical workforce as the virus moves through our state. Um, we don't know how long that will take. 
and we don't know how much money that would take right now. But um, I, I guess in terms of summer programs, we've always supported summer programs. Basically, we pay full time for children who are in child care in the summer. Maybe I need to get more information about that question. Okay. Um, are you still okay. to go back to your other question okay. about the measure? And it's all coming back to me. We're moving very fast here. So there is a letter that's going out. It was not a pop up. We decided on an actual letter um, that is going to go out today because I don't think ledgers are open yet. I think they get they open tomorrow. I want to say. Um, so you will have guidance on that with the coding and everything. So that's going out. Okay. Are you still receiving applications and approving applications for the child care payment program? We are. Yes. And uh, well, a couple of though, if they're, you're talking about children that's being added to the program. Mm -hmm. Yes. We are, but if that, that child is not attending, we're not taking new applications and adding children to ledgers who are not attending classes or the classroom. We are approving them for eligibility and holding them in abeyance until we reopen child care as we know it. So if the, if the child is not going to be coming, this is not an opportunity for um, everyone to scramble and add people to their roles that do not need child care right now. If the child is staying home, we are not looking to grow the census in child care centers because we anticipate and know that we will need that money to make sure that your healthcare workers and your local community can go to work. So uh, to clarify, yes, we are processing applications um, as usual, but we are not necessarily adding those children to ledgers if they are not uh, showing us that their, their parent is actually going to work and going to need that child care. Um, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of child care centers have closed down, so we also have the situation where we don't really have a center to attach them to at this moment in time. So, um, yes, we are processing applications, and if you know that the child needs care and is going to come and attend child care, um, then we are activating that certificate as long as we can find a center to attach it to. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, thank you. We've had a number of questions. I think that you addressed this, but we've had a number of questions related to um, the con whether there are any conditions about centers being paid based on enrollment versus attendance. Uh, will the centers be reimbursed based on enrollment even if the center has closed because of COVID-19 for the months of March and April? Yes, for right now, yes. Oh, well, for March, yes. And the intent is to do that for April as well. We obviously will have to assess the situation as we move forward and make the wisest decisions we can based on the information we have on how to best use the funding we have. But yes, the intent is to pay for enrollment, uh, whether the center is open or closed in both March and April. We've had a number of questions with regard to specific certificate holder, uh, child care payment program uh, payment holders, whether their job has changed and their copay may change or whether their, their uh, redetermination date is coming up or whether um, they've lost their job but still need child care. What are the circumstances about those parents who are already on the child care payment program continuing to retain their child care payment? program status. So for anyone that's going through redetermination right now, and that I addressed this earlier, we are not going to be terminating any of those certificates, okay? If you have, uh, I mean, and that may just answer your question, if there's a, on a case-by-case -case issue, anything other than that, I guess maybe we would have to look at. Um, Carol, is there a specific question outside of redetermination? Because that would encompass if they Yeah, one, one specific question had to do with a parent who changed jobs, which put them in a different income category, so their copay was different. 
And uh, the question was whether that would impact their continuing to receive the child care payment program status. And um, uh, it, and it also had to do with uh, the collection of the co-payment fee. It was another question along those lines. Okay. Well, if they are, if they're, if they're going through the process and like notifying us that they've changed their job, we can adjust that for them. Of course, the certificate would continue, perhaps in the co-pay CEO scale. But if this is happening during the redetermination, we would just continue because what we're doing is we're basically referring that group and. Probably in 90 days when we get some time to allow those parents and we would give a notification to say what their new deadline would be to allow them time to get the information that we need to determine eligibility. Okay. Um, and we've also asked for, did you address the, we haven't talked about the waiver yet, it just reminds me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a big thing. There's yeah. a lot of information. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the some of what we're doing right now is we've already asked for some waivers with the federal government um, that went up last week. Um, it's a little bit of a back and forth process in that we did an initial one two weeks ago. We then had a call with our um, Office of Child Care National Call that we were all on. Based on the information they gave us there, there were some of the items that we could take off our waiver list and just do by amendment very quickly. Amendment um, to the state plan. Amendment to the state plan, yes. And so based on all of that, we should be able to move much faster with amendments and then update our we will hear we expect to hear back from our waiver requests um, the end of this week. They said it would be about seven days. Our final version of it that we agreed on was last Thursday that we submitted. So I'm hoping to hear something by the end of this week. We were hoping they would go ahead and open up the state plan so we could go ahead and make our amendments. But um, our understanding is that the, our federal partners are looking at waivers first and then they will open state plans. I checked again this morning, the state plan is still closed for amendment revisions. So I guess they're holding close to that. But, as soon, but we already have those drafted and ready to go. So as soon as that plan opens, we should be able to implement that and then we would be issue you know what the new revisions would be to the child care payment program based on what gets approved so we need to tell them what the amendments are we were planning to make and then what we've asked for uh, from the waiver process uh, and i think that'll probably answer a lot of the questions that are floating out there um, so part of what we're looking at doing is doing some emergency certificates which would require, normally whenever a certificate is issued, it requires it to be active for 12 months with the exception of some extraordinary circumstances. So for the COVID-19 pandemic, we are looking at supporting, as we talked about earlier, some first responders, essential critical personnel that may just need a very temporary certificate, but that would meet certain requirements for us. So that is part of the waiver that we've asked for. And so we're looking at doing the emergency certificates there we also um, are wanting to look at co-pays. I know many of you have kind of asked about, do we still have to collect co-pays? Well, at this time you do based on how our state plan is written, but we're grasping that again under the sort of an emergency language to say that perhaps we could waive that, which would allow us to pay the full payment of tuition for those centers. That's just not something that we're allowed to do yet, but we're working on that. Um, let's see what else we have here. That's co-payments. We've already talked about um, paying based on enrollment. That is actually an amendment, but we had verbal permission from our feds to go ahead and move forward with that, so we did. So I think we're gonna be fine with that one. Um, what is this one? Some of what we're require, asking for also are, um, just some modifications to immunization and health and safety. We recognize that we may have some children that perhaps cannot get to their form 121 immediately that you would normally have to have whenever you would you know, submit for a certificate. We've actually worked with health and we are gonna have a contact person there that we'll be able to get at least verbal confirmation of immunizations. 
And if we can get these amendments approved, we could use that process to move forward. So basically what we're trying to do is pull down as many barriers that normally we could do in the normal course of business, but because we've got agencies are closed or schools that are closed and doctor's offices, you know, that are closed or limiting, um, you know, people to be able to get records and things like that. Those are what we're looking at to make sure we sort of wipe those barriers away during this time. Um, and then a general overall emergency. We part of we used to before in the past based on emergency on this particular emergency. Um, and that's one of the things I think we would like some feedback on is are the providers able to get, you know, cleaning supplies and things for sanitation and sanitizing their, their centers. So we're looking at you know, what are our options for funding in this crisis that we can do to help providers and help families? So some of our waivers are around just broadening what we can use our funding for. Uh, and that pretty much covers it. Okay, I wanna, um, I, I oh, think wait, I'm One more thing, Carol, um, eligibility okay. requirements. Let me say this real quick for child care certificates. We also are asking them to sort of temporarily allow us to to get some alternative information or um, relax sort of the eligibility rules for like the kind of documents that we would get, for instance, to, to create eligibility for some certificates. Okay, that was the last thing, go ahead. I was just gonna say that I've continued to get a number of questions about the co-payment fee requirements, um, whether parents still have to pay them uh, whether they have to pay them if they're not bringing their children, whether they have to pay them if they are bringing their children, whether they have to pay them if their co-payment has changed. I know that you've spoken to that, but just because of the large number of questions that have come in again about that question, could you just speak to it? Sure. So that change in our policy would require a state plan amendment. And that is one of the things we're planning to do as soon as they open that for us to, to make that change. Right now, it would stay as usual for they would collect the copayment. But once we ask, right. make that amendment and, and implement a policy on the same day, uh, and we'll use the emergency provisions uh, in the APA to waive the 60 day waiting period for the effective date of the policy, we will be asking plan to a zero Co-payment, correct? Right, we can do that. So that would be take immediate effect as of the date of the file. So that then, um, now, have we made a decision about how that will impact those uh, those children who are not attending child care that we were paying for based on enrollment? Okay, we're still looking at how that will impact those that are that are just paying based on enrollment. Um, but our plan is as we add new children and particularly if they're given an emergency certificate that we would just zero out the copay. And uh, so the state would pick up the full rate for each child. Um, and, and we're so looking that, at, I'm, I'm sorry, that would be if you get the waiver or that's the current status. No, this would be done through an amendment to the state plan and it would allow us to implement that. So um, it would allow us, once the policy is filed, to implement that. It does not mean that we will implement it across the board. Um, and how much of our uh, funding that would take and we are considering um, the usage. Uh, so, you know, we're again, that balance of trying to be sure that we reserve enough funding to be able to support uh, critical staff while also keeping some funding going to the child care centers that are closed. Okay, but for this moment, right this minute, they're still supposed to collect co-payment fees? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I... Um, uh, whether the child support requirement is still in effect during this period. It is, but you know that's recently been revised as of March 6th, where they only have to be in cooperation with the child that is they're applying for the certificate for. 
It's not the, all the children in the family anymore. It's just the, the one app, you know, the one child that you're applying for subsidy for. Another question is, do child care centers need to report to DHS if they are closing? Yes, please. We're trying to keep track of that with help. That's very helpful for us. I've had a number of questions about child care centers where they have a very low enrollment and a very few child care certificates, which creates a financial situation that is very to continue. Uh, and um, the question was, is there any assistance available for centers that are in that circumstance? Yeah, so part of what we're looking at, if you remember earlier, we were talking about how we could use our funding and some options. So one of the things we're looking at right now is what grants or other ways to subsidize for loss of income. So that's sort of what we're looking at this coming week. We're waiting to see what our waivers and amendments will allow us to do. Based on that, what funding we would then have available. And I think we will be able to have some funding available to help with providers that are on the program that are in exactly that situation where they have either low enrollment or issues that they, you know, we recognize that that's something that we're going to be looking at. So we, we'll be sending an email out once we work all that out. Um, it might be helpful. I know that we have an idea of this, but um, it would be helpful to know if those centers, you know, if they could send to you where they are, who they are, and what their enrollment, basically just spitball it. What, what are you getting in each day? Um, and what is your capacity? Carol, would you all be willing to collect that information and get that to us? Oh, yes. We'd be happy to do that. So, so what we we're needing... And what we anticipate that we will need is, and this is going to be very fluid, um, we're going to need to track where the needs are, where capacity is, and um, so we are, like I said, interested in helping keep uh, a child care workforce stable, but we are also anticipating that there will be great need for child care soon. So, you know, we're going to need to know who can take children in their centers and um, who is willing to take children in their centers. And if there are centers that are willing to open, should there be a, a you know, a great need arise suddenly? I had a question about whether you know of a source where centers could go to get protective personal equipment for staff. I do not know. So we've been looking and we've been talking to MEMA to let them know that, you know, we are going to need some supplies potentially. Um, you know, we've reached out to some our partners. Um, I know recently thermometers so we're trying to get some of those but I don't have a I mean I, I would be interested to know what your providers have out there you know in the community if y'all have some resources that you could share with us even but you know they're aware here at the agency that I mean that's something that we're looking at but not a particular vendor that like I could share or know of I really don't do y'all have any Thing to add about that. No, we're trying to work through NEMA to um, purchase supplies, but uh, you know, I think everybody realizes those are um, they're very difficult to come by. Um, I think you know, if if we could continue to get feedback on what is critically missing for child care workers to take care of. Um, particularly <clears throat> emergency certificate children, um, you know, we will continue to, I, I hope that these supplies will, um, the production will, you know, begin to kind of open up some channels for that. Um, so, you know, I had been told gloves, uh, mask, and um, wipes or hand sanitizer uh, were big critical needs. Um, 
And we are trying to look for a supply source for that. I don't know that it will be enough of those supplies to, we are talking about trying to, um, you know, outfit potentially emergency centers should they be needed. Um, so I just don't, we don't have a good read right now on what, what resources we can lay our hands on. I had one question about if um, a center decides they need to close, could they possibly lose their children to other centers that opt to remain open? Yes, um, and that is, I'm sorry, I know that probably, you know, we could all have it, everything that we want, but the problem is that if those children, if their parents are having to go to work, for a critical or an essential job, um, we've got to have child care for them somewhere. And um, so, yes, we are allowing children to transfer to an open center. We are not allowing children to transfer to a closed center. And that's kind of our, you know, uh, yep, that's, that's the best way we could uh, Split the baby is probably a bad term on this webinar, but um, that's the way we, we came down with to strike the balance there. Okay. Um, I had a quest, couple of questions about whether um, the children of medical staff and essential workers, even if they don't qualify for childcare certificates could be uh, paid, if the center could be paid for serving those children? So if they do not have a traditional qualify for subsidy, part of what we're looking at is what I mentioned earlier, which is through the state plan amendment, but we're trying to create a priority class of people that are emergency personnel, staff basically, that would qualify for that priority group and allow me to give temporary certificates is the best way to explain that. We're also looking at sort of a plan. We recognize that there's gonna be a need for childcare out there. And if, if a lot of centers are closed and these essential personnel need somewhere to go, part of what we're trying to consider is a contingency plan for how do we open a, just a very temporary emergency childcare center, right? Um, and we've been working on that plan as well because they've got to have somewhere to go and we can't you know you know the, the backbone of kind of our society is that you know a healthcare worker needs somewhere for their child to go and if all the centers are closed or there's not enough room based on the distance you know the group sizes of 10 there's lots of things that are unique to this COVID-19 situation that have created this need so we're working on that as well I'm, hang on, I'm confused a little bit so you're saying if they weren't already subsidy if they qualify for subsidy, like just like they were going to qualify tomorrow, like they would have a month ago, they could be a certificate child. That's not a problem. If they, if you come in and, and there's like, like there's not an emergency certificate that we're doing other than the redetermination group, because we're not terminating any of those right now. That's fine. But there's not an emergency priority class yet, because that has to be done through a state amendment. So we're asking. For but that. we are asking, yeah, and it should be approved. Yeah, I don't think there will be any. So the plan is yes to have certificates available. Um, our our plan is to have a three month certificate. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to, you know, obviously has to. We have to have a waiver of that twelve month requirement, right. um, and that uh, we would be in a position to help supplement the cost of childcare through that certificate. I think the goal is that. Um, you know, we're, we've talked with a couple of hospitals already, and some hospitals are looking at opening their own child care center at their uh, site that they already own. And in that regard, we're providing expertise and technical assistance for them to do that, but maybe funding, maybe in the form of an emergency certificate for uh, children whose parents you know, go up to a certain income level. Um, but right now what we've asked for is permission 
to award a short-term emergency certificate um, with some of the details to be sort of fleshed out as we see where the need is. Um, I have had a number of child care centers respond that cleaning supplies would be great <laughs> to your question okay. earlier. Um, okay. I've also had a number of questions about uh, what to do in certain circumstances in this difficult moment, and they include statements like, what if there has been a COVID-19 diagnosis in the child's family, but the family wants to continue to bring the child to child care? What should the child care center do? Um, uh, another instance of a child care center um, not being able to afford the number of staff that it would take to reduce the group size to meet the uh, required uh, no more than 10 group. Um, do you have any comments about those instances? Um, as far as like staffing, that's, I mean, it's really just going to come down to a business decision about whether or not, you know, if you are going to follow those guidelines, um, you know, a reduction in your staff, uh, you know, you just, those are just, just a call that you have to make. Um, as far as parents, uh, or if you have a child or a family member of a child that has been exposed to COVID-19, again, it's really up to the provider if you feel it's best to you know, ask that child, um, you know, I think it's, there are guide, there is guidance on, you know, how long, you know, um, once there's a, a confirmed COVID case, but really that's more of a question that you would need to um, address with, with the Department of Health. Um, they have a COVID-19 hotline that you can call and you can get, um, you can get guidance from one of the, the medical staff that's there at the health department. Um, every case is going to be different. Every situation is going to be a little bit different. So the nuances of the situation are going to be important. Um, and also, and Chad, I would, I would just also uh, offer to our listeners that we are going to have a webinar tomorrow at two o'clock in the afternoon with the State Department of Health Child Care Licensure. And so some of those uh, questions could be posed tomorrow. Yeah, that's very right. Um, and you know, if if you're if you're not really getting a lot of guidance, I mean, or if you feel like you know the guidance that you're getting from the Department of Health, if you're not really sure, I would recommend contacting a physician in your community. Um, and just again, you don't give them names or you know the parents or children, but just you know, in very you know, in very general terms, say you know, there's a child that attends my child care center one of their family members, uh, you know, has a confirmed case of COVID-19, what would you recommend? Um, I have a question about, will the centers be notified if a parent requests a change of providers? I think that's part of the problem. They have to sign off on the change of provider form already, so that's Yes, they would know if someone's going to be moving. We will still follow the, right, the same procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. so, and that's why we need to know that then uh, that's why we need to know if centers are closed. Um, you know, the goal here is to not penalize centers for choosing to close uh, if they don't feel like they can operate the center safely, but also to um, you know, to have child care when we need it. Or at least know where the resources are for building out child care. I had one question about whether there will be any training offered for child care centers to operate during this um, public health crisis epidemic circumstance. We, we can absolutely look into that and, and provide that for y'all. I know health, we, we need to talk to health and see what they're already done in the works, but, and, but yes, we can look into getting that. Mm -hmm. Sure. I've had a couple of questions. Oh, it would have to be like a distance type training. Yeah, you know, it would have to be like a Zoom type thing, but I mean, we could definitely 
put something together just and even maybe fill in some questions about more about the screening process that's recommended or hand washing or you know ideas with how to handle those group sizes sure um i uh i just uh had a couple of questions about um hazard pay if there would be any hazard work pay for centers or um if uh there would be any um extra money given to centers that are remaining open for the extra costs related to cleaning supplies and extra staff and that sort of thing. We're evaluating that. That is one of the reasons we ask for the flexibility to give grants. Um, and uh, so it's possible. Um, and particularly we recognize that, you know, especially as, as sort of the pattern of need arises, that we probably, you know, will need some way to uh, compensate and but and incentivize child care centers to um, step up and help make sure that we keep our workforce um, taking care of patients. So we just don't know exactly what format that will take yet. Um, I had a couple of questions about, you know, the. Um, recent federal stimulus package included some uh, funds through the SBA loan program for small businesses, which would include most child care centers. Does, right. does DHS plan to offer any um, training or assistance to child care centers for how to take advantage of that? Uh, we can investigate if there are um, trainings i suspect that there are at least informational packets put together out there i don't think it's something we have the expertise to put together for uh, child care providers I, but i know that uh, my husband and i have a small business and we've been talking with our accountant who has spent you know the last five days waiting through that legislation it's voluminous um however uh yes i do think that um we can look to see if we can link some information like that on our website. I think that there are groups that have put together some uh, pretty good synopsis of, of that they will need records, uh, financial records of um, payroll history uh, and um, there may be some rent and um, Utilities allowed, it's uh, roughly the formula is that 2.5 times their payroll based on a history over the past 12 years. There's some formulas that are kind of complex, but I do uh, think that child care providers would qualify for that. Now, let me say that that uh, relief anticipates that they would pay their staff. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, taking that money and not paying your payroll would be fraudulent and um so the you know the goal is to leave as few people as possible without some form of income coming in um, we all that ultimately we all have to stay home for a period of time to uh unless you are absolutely essential to keeping um you know essential services going. And so we're trying to get money into the hands of people so they can stay home. Yes, and I'll just say to those who are uh, participating that we do plan to offer a webinar on that SBA loan opportunity for small businesses so that childcare centers will know what they need to do and how to apply. Um, I also have gotten a number of questions to DHS. Do you happen to know how many centers have officially closed at this point? Um, as of as of the end of last week, it was a little over 900. That was what the uh, Department of Health reported to us. It was about 917. I've had a couple of questions from centers that have opted to remain open, uh, saying that they've gotten some negative um, 
uh, responses to their decision to remain open because there have been orders for the schools to be closed and there is an impression that they shouldn't be open and yet they have parents in their uh, communities who need child care and so they're trying to remain open to be of service um, and they're finding that a very difficult circumstance to navigate. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Well, you know, that's the conundrum for all of us right now. We have a duty to stay home and we have a duty to social distance. But I, I, some of us have to be here to make sure right. that these things happen. Um, likewise, in our communities, and, you know, this is an unusual disaster in that things look perfectly normal outside except for the absence of people on the streets. Um, but it is coming and we are seeing it grow at a predictable rate. And, you know, we know that we have to have food available for people to buy and we have to have, uh, the ability for at the, at the apex of this crisis, we are going to have to have, um, support for those healthcare workers who need to go to work. And, um, you know, that includes custodians and uh, food service workers. And, um, you know, there's uh, policemen have got to be on the streets and firemen have got to be able to respond to fires. Are there businesses out there that are not participating in good faith? In this, yeah, probably so. And there are probably people who are going to work just because, um, I don't know. But I think that the governor and the state of Mississippi have recognized that child care is an essential service and it is the backbone of our workforce. And that's something that we've all known all of this time. And frankly, this is our opportunity to demonstrate that in a very meaningful way. Um, it is an opportunity to show that you can't, it is, you can't have the rest of those services if parents don't have a safe place to leave their children. So I, I think that on the other side of all of this, child care is going to be some heroes of the backbone of that engine. So, um, I appreciate those centers who are willing to struggle and grapple with all of the questions and the fears of remaining open. Um, and who will, you know, we're gonna ask some of you to come alongside us over the next few months and step up and, and help deliver childcare. Um, we really need your feedback. If you have, some of you have been very open about sending texts to me um, when you have ideas. These are complex problems. They are difficult to think through, and um, there's not an easy answer. So, um, you know, we ask that you join with us and that you, in the, you know, if, if you've got suggestions for things that we should be thinking about that we're not, we want to hear them. Um, I do have a, a couple of friends who've texted me questions directly, and one has to do with, um, status of full-time versus part-time, how will we deal with that as we move towards summer? I think that that is, you know, one of those issues we'll have to evaluate um, as we get closer to that time. Um, I think it's safe to say we will not be back um, at work by Easter. Will we be back at work by the end of May? I don't know. I certainly hope so. Um, but, you know, this, this is there's just no way to know right now. Um, we are not at this point in time allowing changes of full time, part time to full time, unless the child's attending, right? Well, they get the full enrollment. Well, yeah, you're right about that. Thing, so, yes. Basically, ledgers, well, our goal is to keep ledgers stable right, right now. Wherever they were. Right? We're not looking to give anybody a windfall of something they weren't otherwise making. Um, and so, you know, I, I understand that that might be relevant as we move towards summer uh, to consider. But, um, you know, right now our goal is just to keep incomes relatively stable. Uh, by income, I mean 
um, you know, we don't we don't pay the full income of a child care center, obviously, we are subsidizing, but to keep that subsidy level uh, stable to the extent possible. And right now our commitment for that is through April. Um, so we'll evaluate that question again, probably as, you know, if we approach May and realize that, that we're still going to uh, be living in this type of situation. Yeah, I did have a number of questions about what happens uh, after April. So um, I guess uh, we'll just wait. Do you have any timeline in mind about when you might let people know post uh, April 30th what we might expect? Well, I think by then we'll definitely have our response back on our waiver requests. We'll be able to see what amendments get approved. So I think in the next, you know, two to four weeks, we're going to have much more clarity to be able to, you know, tell y'all. And again, we're going to have all this posted on our webpage. We're going to be sending emails out. I know there was some concern about centers that are closed. If they're really being, you know, checking those emails, that's important. Make sure that if you are closing your center and you're at home, that you have access to those emails because that's the quickest way we can get information to you. I mean, we're also posting it on the website, but we want to get it to them as fast as we can with any updates. I've had a number of questions about the um, funds coming for um, the month of March and whether funds could be received before the 15th because of the increased expenses centers have experienced. Uh, is there um, a timeline with regard to payment? Well, it's a much bigger question, really, because that involves lots of parts of our agency. So the process that we have right now where we distribute the checks through budgets, and we're also working with a little bit of a skeleton crew as well because of social distancing. So we plan to have those checks on time. I don't foresee us being able to do it early this month. I understand that is an issue and that people are looking to get that as quickly as we can. That is something we can potentially look at for April. Um, for the next pay cycle, if we could figure out how to push that, but we do have to give them time to, you know, there, there are some requirements around submitting the ledger, how many days we have to pay within, all that still has to, to stay the same. So I don't foresee us moving that timeline up. It would involve logistically a lot of other things to make that happen. And as an agency, you know, we're just trying to make sure we continue business as usual. Um, I had a question. Um, should a center stay open if they don't have the supplies? If staff are at risk, what should they do? Will they be penalized if they don't have enough staff to open? Well, all of our policies and all of our initiatives right now have been, um, I hope it's clear that our goal is to not penalize those um, centers that make the decision that they can no longer stay open safely. Uh, we know some of our centers are staffed by uh, an older population, and um, certainly, you know, guidelines are that those persons are most at risk. We are trying to honor and respect those decisions by making policies that supplement, um, you know, keeping the centers um, stable at least. Uh, so no, we are not penalizing in any way, or it's certainly not our goal to. And if that's a, an outcome of some of our policy decisions, we certainly would like to get feedback on that. Um, we are just saying that we, we don't know how long we can keep that commitment. Um, we're committed through April right now, and um, we do encourage every center to make decisions based on your circumstances and what you think you can do safely. Um, so, you know, if you, if you have to evaluate, if you know that you have a very tiny cramped space um, and that, or that there are some specific constrictions in your setup that, that make it very difficult to spread out, I mean, those are all factors that have to be considered. And so um, we will look at that question about training for, you know, just talking through some of those issues. Some of this, you know, just requires some creativity. And, um, you know, ultimately, there is some risk involved. There is a 
well for nurses and doctors to do their work right now. We all know that. Um, so we all have to kind of decide what our tolerance is for that risk um, and do the very best we can to be as safe as possible in doing this. Unfortunately, there's just not a, an instruction manual. Um, I'm going to have to ask to step out, and I thank you all for having me. Christy and Chad are going to wrap things up, uh, but I'm, I'm being <laughs> all the way called elsewhere. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you, Andrea, so much for being with Carol, us. Carol, thanks today. for setting us up. This is yeah, very and we will. Uh, we will ask just a couple more questions. I know we're a little past the hour that you all agreed to participate with us, and I'm grateful that you agreed to stay on. Um, I did have a question about what um, um, amendments and revisions in the uh, child care payment program that you're requesting and whether uh, people have access to that information or how we would be notified of those. So the amendments right now are in draft form. Some of the amendments will depend on the response I get from the waivers as to what we need to do with some of the amendments. Um, so it's not public right now because it's not any kind of a final draft. Once we get the amendments um, submitted and approved, then we will be filing you know, the revised state plan and we will update all that. Everybody will have access to see what the changes are. Um, I will probably likely just put in an email what the various amendment changes were just to make it easy for everybody. Um, so you don't have to hunt through and see what the different ones were. So I'll consolidate all that so that you'll be able to tell. But it's it's sort of a work in progress right now. So to have it now, frankly, would not be beneficial because again, it will depend on what some of the other responses are. But yeah, we're gonna, we'll let them know all that. You know, have that public problem. And we'll also be making some policy changes based on what the amendments that are approved. So there'll be that companion piece as well. So y'all be able to see both. Okay. Um, for those questions we weren't able to get to today, we will uh, follow up with DHS and try to respond to each one. Um, Christy, Chad, thank you so much for the time that you've given us today. And uh, this webinar is um, has been recorded. We're going to make the recording available to everyone who signed up to participate today so you can refer back to it. Um, and again, I'd like to let you know that um, the webinar tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock is going to be with the State Department of Health Child Care Licensure. So thanks to everyone for participating uh, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank thanks, you. Carol. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Bye. Bye.